I was out with my girlfriend at the time. I am my best friend and his wife. We went out to a really secluded part of Smoky Mountain National Park on the Carolina side. We had to drive on a five mile dead end mountain winding road to get to the parking lot before we could go camping. Parking lot empty. Not a soul around for miles. No cell reception. A minute after we park, we see a car pull into the parking lot a few hundred yards ahead. A single man gets out and walks to the tunnel after which the hiking trail starts. His demeanor was kind of zombie blank like. It didn't help that the last town that we visited before going to the hike looked like a bunch of meth ripped the town a new one. Everyone looked zonked, skinny dirty, with no Fs given. Anyways, this guy comes up to the edge of the tunnel and attempted to dig around using a shovel that he had with him for a minute or two. Then he walked back to his car. On the way back, he did ask where we were going, and without thinking, I made the mistake of telling him which hiking path we were planning on taking. And then a few minutes later, he went back to his car and drove off. Remember, this was a secluded, winding mountain, dead-end road that you had to drive five miles on before hitting the parking lot. So basically, this guy made that drive to poke at the ground and then left. We didn't see a single other car the whole time we were there. We ended up hiking for a few hours, and then it started getting dark, and we were getting lost and ill-prepared at best, with two dainty women and nearly dead flashlights. Also, the place was known to have bears. We ended up walking back. When we got back to the parking lot, we were very relieved when our car was still there. Apparently everyone was freaked out about this guy coming back and doing something awful. There was no good explanation of why he went there except that he was following us. There was no one around to help. He could have stolen the car, cut the brakes, and or done stalked us and no one would ever know or find us. I still have no idea why the guy went there or what he was doing there. But definitely feel we made the right call not to leave the car there overnight. I had woke up early in the morning to use the restroom. When I went to step back into my room, I noticed something in my window staring at me. It was dark in the room. My window was wide open without a screen. This was also a trailer house which had higher windows than most homes. I seen a reddish orange reflection of two eyes looking at me after a sec of trying to see what it was. I realized it wasn't anything I've ever seen before. I stood in the hallway with this animal staring at me for what felt like 30 seconds, but it was more like five, 10 seconds before I had enough courage to scream. I was so scared I couldn't move or scream. This thing had to have been seven half feet tall. I measured it from the ground up to the window where the top of the head would have been. This home is kind of out in the hills and is a forested area with a lot of rabbits and there was also a grapevine about three feet from my window. This image has never left my mind and when I talk about it, it makes that fear come over me again. I know what I saw and would take a lie detector test to prove what I saw and I do believe it was a Bigfoot. It's 3.43 a.m. in Tempe. My friend and I often like to explore parks late at night, early in the morning. Uh, tonight we went to Papago Park. From the moment we arrived, there was a car park, but no one in the car. We thought maybe somebody was sleeping, but upon quickly glancing, we didn't see anybody, so we went to the park. From the moment we stepped out of the car, I saw a tall, lanky, humanoid looking. Something. I thought it was a person, but after blinking, it disappeared. My friend then saw the same figure, except black, a short distance from where I had spotted it. We figured our minds were just playing with us, so we went and decided to swing. The whole time we heard rustling around us. She started to get nervous, so we started walking back to my car. I could see a small black figure pacing quickly, almost running back and forth between the trees. We were talking about it amongst ourselves when the car alarm went off. We booked it for my car and got in. 
As we drove away, there was still no sight of any actual person in the car or park. I went the wrong direction when we started leaving. So I had to do a U-turn and as I drove away, we could see the figure again pacing between trees. We were so freaked out that we stopped at a gas station where I'm writing this to Google what it could have been. Does anybody have any clue what we may have seen tonight? My brother-in-law and his friend were sharing a tent when they joined us in camping for the weekend. When they woke up, they immediately questioned us as to who was walking around messing with them that night. He looked at me first, but I slept all night, as did my brother and my father. They then were very confused as to what it could be, because they said that something with massive rough hands grabbed their feet, which were hanging out of the unzipped tent to allow for ventilation in the heat, and pushed them aside and back in the tent. And they were awake while this happened and immediately looked outside their tent and saw nothing. They zipped up their tent and couldn't sleep all night. I was with two friends. We were sitting there on the rocks. It was getting dark. All of a sudden, we started hearing rustling sounds. All of a sudden, we started seeing figures moving around behind us. We were smoking cigarettes, and I guess they must have been attracted to the smell. I thought it was cops with dogs. I don't know exactly how many figures there were, but there were more than two. All of a sudden, they stopped moving and sort of disappeared into the surroundings. We didn't know what to think. We were literally scared out of our wits. So we just stood up and casually walked away. I have had numerous experiences by myself and with others in this park that corroborate this initial experience. This one night my senior year, after homecoming, I decided to stay at one of my friend's house. Including me, there was about five other people there. We usually would mess around with spirit box or whatever because we were bored, high schoolers in the Appalachian Mountains. What else were we supposed to do? We messed around with it for a while then. My friend had an idea to play with an IG board while the others were just chilling on the bed. We weren't getting any results by playing around with it, so we stopped and went back to the spirit box. My father died a few years back and the spirit box said, his name then powered itself off. Me and my friends were in shock, of course, so we decided to call it quits for the night. About an hour passed and my friend had to go outside to go feed his chickens. When he went outside, we heard some tapping on the window, so we thought it was him playing a joke on us. So we sent our other friend outside to check on him. The tapping began again. At this point, we were like, wow, so funny guys, thinking they both were in on it. Then we heard walking upstairs, we were in the basement of the house, which was weird because no one was there other than my friends in the basement and the two outside. Suddenly, the two who were outside bursted inside. The friend who went out first was a pretty big guy who never got scared by anything. His face was completely pale like he had seen a ghost, so we were like, what the hell happened? Apparently, when he was outside feeding his chickens, he heard something walking in the woods. At first, he thought it was a deer or maybe some other animal. But when he went inside the chicken house, apparently, he heard someone whisper, please help me, in an airy and deep struggling voice. My friends who were in the basement decided to go back outside with him just to check if there was anyone on the property. So obviously they went outside with guns because we're county bumpkins. And I decided to stay inside because it was colder than a witch's tit outside. I was sitting in my friend's computer chair just chilling when suddenly it sounded like someone was running around upstairs. Hell, it was everywhere. It even sounded like it was in the walls at one point. So I ran like hell outside barefoot in like 30 degree weather. I found the guys by the chicken coop and asked if they were pranking me and explained what happened. But all of them had been outside. It was just unexplainable. We only used the Ouija board for a few minutes, but there was just something off, especially since things were happening outside the house and inside. I've been thinking about posting this for a while. Has anyone else had a, a similar experience?
one of my old drinking. Buddy's back home was the token hunter of our group, a great dude who always had stories. One day, he shows up to a party looking kind of spooked, so we ask him what's wrong. Apparently, him and his hunting buddy were a few kilometers away from their truck, just enjoying the hike through the gorgeous Alberta wilderness. And they had their deer tags and were just out enjoying the process. After a few hours of unsuccessfully searching for deer, they turned around and headed back, following their own tracks in to get out. It turns out that there were fresh mountain lion tracks that started almost immediately from the truck and followed their footsteps the entire way into the bush. They'd been followed by a mountain lion the minute they got out of the truck and had no idea. He said that it wasn't uncommon to see mountain lion tracks, but apparently something about being the singular focus of one for so many hours had the two completely spooked. I get it, man. That's some apex predator nonsense that I want new to part of. I went on a small trek with a couple of my friends in dense forest, and while coming back down, it was dark already. As we walked down the mountain, we used our torch woods, almost dying. So in midway, we heard some noise in trees, and we didn't see any animal there. We thought there may be monkeys hovering upon trees, and we decided to make loud noise with some metal stuff we had, as the monkeys won't come near. Now an hour passed, we were almost down the mountain. Still we could hear noises in trees, but no sight of any animals. As we reached down there was a small temple with dim light where we decided to rest as we felt safe. Now the force part was over and there was huge barren farmland with clear sight, no trees around and we had to walk two kilometers more to reach our car. After 15 minutes of rest, we decided to go ahead as we stepped out of the temple, we saw two huge black bears passing by. They were barely seven, eight feet away from us. They followed us all the way down the mountain, and luckily they went on the other direction. We ran the shit out of there until we reached our car. Hiking in Big Bend, National Park on a super remote trail on the east side of the park. I was completely alone and there was absolutely no ranger, station, or civilization for at least 30 miles. As I approached the 7th mile of a 14 mile trail, I stop and take in the scenery. Um, due to the remoteness of Big Bend and being in the low desert at noon, it was completely silent. As I'm approaching a large canyon pictured below, I get a hunch. I always hike alone, I'm a little paranoid, so I always try to be aware of my surroundings. As I stop, I hear a giant noise that I can only describe as a roaring lion scream, combined into one sound. It seemed to be lower in the canyon, but it echoed through the silence. I was pretty sleep deprived, so I brushed it off as a hallucination or something. Then I hear it again, this time it was loud and it seemed to be right up the trail. I get that fight or flight response. Sweaty palms, dry mouth, shaking. My biggest fear is a mountain lion, and I was afraid that I had messed up going on this trail alone. As I was in my stance, I just screamed, I'm not scared of you bitch, as loud as I could. After a couple screams, a creature appears up the trail. It was a wild bear left by old settlers. He howling its way down the canyon wall. It just looked at me for a second and kept going. When I was at church camp many years ago, the tradition that was fulfilled every year was to visit an abandoned house in the dead of night with the campers and tell scary stories about the past residents of said residents. A pretty long trail from the camp is the fastest trail, along with camp counselors jumping out to scare the kids. A head count was taken once during the trip and also when the campers got to the house. A camper was reported missing. Once we got to the house, and a group of counselors were scrambled to find her, she was found back at camp unconscious in her cabin. She didn't remember returning to her cabin, but she was very sore. No other details are known other than that hermits live in the camp during the winter. I 
I was bicycle touring through Europe solo and was riding through Austria heading west from Vienna on a path that followed the Donab River. I should also note it was wild camping most nights to save money aka just setting up a tent wherever the F it seemed like no one would bother me. When it came time to find a place to sleep one night I found a random dirt road that peeled off into the woods I ended up following it for a bit before finding a meadow I could hide my tent in. I did the evening routine just like every other night and passed out. Sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up to one of the most terrifying animal scream mons I have ever heard. After lying there for a minute wondering if it was just a dream, I heard it again, then again, but closer and closer and closer till it sounded like it was right outside my tent. The thing to remember is that I was that nobody on planet Earth knew where I was there, which was a very unsettling thought as I lay there with my knife in one hand and light in the other ready to stab to shit whatever demon creature burst through my tent wall. Then just like that, I stopped for a couple seconds before I heard the noise moving away from me. The noise kept echoing through the woods for a couple minutes, getting further and further away each time. After a terrible couple hours of trying to sleep and waiting for the sun, I got out of the tent looking for any sign of said creature, which there was none. After telling someone about this, they said it was probably a boar, which indeed it was, which is also unsettling because those people are mean. We lived in the Kaimichi Mountains with a mountain cream of land at the base of the mountain. It was late at night and something sprinted in the corner of my eye. My boyfriend quickly ran to the edge of the porch as my dog chased after it. Once I realized what I was seeing, I was begging my dog to come back. It was about five foot tall, hunched over with white and black fur. The color of this thing was almost glitchy. It had ears on top of its head and a short snout. We see no arms at all while it was running and also a tail which was a fuzzy tail. It was bipedal and running so fast, but its head wasn't bobbing at all. As my dog ran towards it, she was physically confused and she stopped and shook her head. She was running the wrong direction. She's not a dumb dog. She's a cattle dog and she's never deliberately ran the wrong direction at something she's pursuing. In my shock, all I could mutter was, oh my God, is that a human? as it was the only thing I could think of seeing this dog person running across my yard. The next thing I knew, my boyfriend was walking in the yard to get a better view of it whilst I was trying not to pee my pants. This dog thing scaled a cow fence about five feet tall behind our RV within absolute seconds. I was halfway inside the house scared to even be outside, still screeching for my dog to return as she regained her brains and was chasing the thing. My boyfriend said it stood up in the cow field right under the only single light post in the field with its back to him and its shoulders broad and its height easily adding another three feet just standing straight up. Now this all took place within seconds but it was all so clear and slow motion happening. We did investigate the fence the next morning and did find some white coarse hair on the top of the fence but we ended up losing it shortly after. With no evidence of this, all we have is both of our stories, but they line up immaculately. Living there, I've seen the beast once more on my own, which scared me shitless. A suspected pterodactyl. Ghosts, hundreds of UFOs, weird lights, and our windows, possible Bigfoots, and a strange woman's voice on the opposite side of a hunting dog's pen. Asking a question in an unknown language with no dogs to bark at her, which is super strange. Has anyone ever seen anything like this? We sighted what we believe to be a Bigfoot. While driving to the coast on Little U Smith River Road, we were driving the convertible and Mill was taping the road as we drove. A Bigfoot or whatever it was came from behind a tree and ran quickly into the woods. It was about two football fields away and was in the video for a very short time. It appeared silver at that distance and seemed to run with its hands at its side. Our 
on it, my eyes are watering because all, even thinking about this memory frightens me. I used to live in a small section of New York called Sullivan County, which was known for bad reception, rednecks, and all types of addicts. Needless to say, it is not the best day of areas nor the most populated. And was seated in the driver's seat of my boyfriend's car as he drove towards his uncle's home. We had to go there to make a pit stop, and afterwards, we were going to pick up one of our friends and take him home. On the way, driving to DJ's, my boyfriend, uncle. So we ran into a bit of a car jam, extra rare for lack of people, in which there was a car on fire in the middle of an intersection less than 15 feet from us. The moon was bright above us, and as I looked at the burning car, I swore I could hear screams. The moon legit seemed to turn pinkish, and as my blood curdled, I yelped for DJ to find another road. I am an empath as well as he, and I could tell we were both having a physical as well as a spiritual impact by what we were seeing. He backed up and took a side road to his NCs, which was about 25 minutes longer than the normal route. On a little shortcut through spoopy woods, we almost ran over a red fox that literally jumped from some bushes. Followed five minutes later by a gigantic panic stag running straight through our headlights nearly crashing into the front portion of our car as it bounded through the road in the forest. Female doe were all the occurrence but a male stag that gigantic and a red fox were incredibly rare. When we got to his uncle's driveway we sat and spoke in low voices about what we had seen and I was shook. At the moment I was saying to him that I felt death in the air. A bird of some kind came and flew straight into his uncle's truck which was parked in front of us. I yelped and ran to check on it. It had broken its neck and looked like a sweet brown bird from what I could see. Uh, my boyfriend didn't let me spend much time on the little thing as he pushed me into the front door. Uh, the night got scarier from there, but I think I'm done recounting for now. During hunting season, headed to a clear cut before first light. What we thought was a bear at first came down the bank to the right of the truck onto the road directly in front of us, approximately 10 yards away. Stopped, looked over, and then took off down the bank on the opposite side of the road. Several distinct things to me were the fact that its eyes were bright yellow from the headlights, which usually indicates a predator, i.e. cougars, bobcats, wolves, etc. Also, it moved at a high rate of speed down the mountain as soon as my friend began to exit the truck. By high rate of speed, I mean inhuman, like a scared elk or something, and it was pretty steep terrain. The lighthouse in the middle of the National Forest was a sight to behold. A relic of the past its weather-worn stone walls and towering structures stood defiantly against the elements, surrounded by the beauty of the dense forest that stretched as far as the eye could see. History whispered through the aged bricks, telling tales of ships guided safely by its light in years gone by. As the park ranger Jenner arrived at the lighthouse, she was met with an eerie sense of quietude. The air felt charged with anticipation as if something was waiting to reveal itself. However, upon an initial inspection, everything seemed normal. Jenna explored the lighthouse, climbed the winding stairs to its peak, and marveled at the breathtaking views. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the forest, Jenna decided to spend the night in the lighthouse before returning to the main base in the morning. She made herself comfortable feeling a mix of excitement and apprehension about the prospect of spending a night alone in the historic structure. As night enveloped the forest, Jenna lit a small lantern and settled in for the night. However, the tranquility was short-lived. Whispers danced through the air, almost imperceptible at first, but soon growing louder and more unsettling. Knocking echoed through the walls as if an unseen presence demanded attention at the lighthouse's door. Jenna approached the door cautiously, heart pounding in her chest. She opened it, but there was no one in sight. 
The forest outside seemed to be swaying with a life of its own, yet there was no human presence to explain the eerie sounds. She felt like she was being watched, the sensation of discomfort intensifying with each passing moment. Determined to uncover the source of the eerie occurrences, Jenna continued her exploration of the lighthouse. She ventured into the basement, guided only by the flickering light of her lantern. The air felt heavy and oppressive, as if the walls themselves held secrets of their own. As she opened the basement door, Jenna gasped in horror. There, stumbling and waddling before her, was a creature like nothing she had ever seen before. Its ghastly appearance was enough to make her stomach churn and its vacant, hollow eyes sent shivers down her spine. The creature was tall, impossibly so, and disturbingly skinny, as if it had emerged from the depths of a nightmare. Without warning, the creature lunged at Jenna, its disfigured jaw opening wide with a haunting scream. In a moment of terror, Jenna's world went black as the creature overpowered her. When Jenna woke, the next day the sun was shining and everything appeared to be back to normal. The airy occurrences had ceased, leaving her bewildered and questioning her own sanity. Had it all been a vivid dream or had she truly encountered a malevolent presence within the lighthouse's walls? When I was growing up, I lived in a town that currently has a population just shy of 200, so less than. We would go hunting and fishing and camping a lot, and I don't remember what the reason for this one trip was, but we were driving him down. The dirt road, a lot of the roads were dirt, but that one, called the dirt road, no people anywhere around back then. It is late at night and I see an orange glowing thing just over the tree line. I ask my father what it is and he says it is the moon. But one issue if that was the moon. What was the sliver not quite as fully round thing on the other side of the road? Anyway, whatever it was dipped below the tree line. And apparently, I was the only person who ever saw it. The hunt had started out like any other hunting trip with friends. Excitement filled the air as we ventured into the secluded forest determined to track down and hunt bears. The dense trees and the thick underbrush made the hunt challenging, but it was precisely the kind of adventure we craved. As we moved deeper into the forest, we decided to split up, hoping to cover more ground and increase our chances of spotting a bear. I went my own way, following my eye instincts and the faint signs of animal activity. The forest was eerily silent, with only the rustling of leaves and occasional bird calls breaking the quiet. It was then that I caught a whiff of something odd, something foul and pungent. My curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to follow the stench, wondering if it might lead me to a potential bear sighting. I moved cautiously, making sure not to make any noise that could scare off my prey. As I walked deeper into the forest, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. The smell grew stronger and I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. Then I looked up and saw it, something unlike anything I'd ever encountered. The creature had a round human sized head, but instead of a beak, it had an unsettling featureless face. Enormous bat-like wings adorned its body which stretched about five to six feet in length. The wingspan was easily 25 to 30 feet wide with no feathers, just the eerie appearance of bat-like skin that was jet black. What really caught my attention was its long, skinny tail, measuring about four to five feet, resembling that of a rat or a dragon sticking straight out. The strange being didn't fly like a bird. Rather, it glided gracefully, about 10 feet off the ground, moving at a plodding speed. After gliding for about 50 to 75 feet, it took a single huge flap of its wings, maintaining its elevation, and continued gliding, disappearing into the woods up ahead. The encounter left me awestruck and puzzled. What kind of creature was that? It seemed almost otherworldly, and I couldn't make sense of what I had just witnessed. My instincts told me that this creature must be living underground, possibly near a hot spring due to its lack of feathers. Shaken by the experience, I raised my rifle, hoping to get a shot at the creature to prove its existence to my friends. 
I steadied my aim and pulled the trigger, but my shot missed its mark. The creature didn't react at all. It just vanished deeper into the forest. When I finally reunited with my friends, I eagerly told them my story, hoping they would believe me. But instead, they laughed and dismissed my encounter as a figment of my imagination or a practical joke. Their mockery stung, but I couldn't blame them for not understanding the inexplicable sight I had witnessed. Spent three weeks out in the Colorado wilderness with a safe survival camping group that checked in with your every three days to drop food. Check your water and take your trash with them. They knew where the 12 of us were, but we didn't really know where each other were because it was more of a solo thing than a group camp. The closest person to me was about 200 yards away, but we didn't see each other during the 18 days of camping, just on the hike in and hike out. Six, seven days into it, I was sitting out in my chair with a book when I noticed someone about 50 yards away just meandering through the trees. Supply came the next day and I mentioned it, but they said it was pretty unlikely to be a random person because this was a private area and there was really only one way and that wasn't super rugged. I saw the same person again a few days later, this time going the exact opposite way and walking like they didn't have a care in the world. I think I had a full day alone before supply that time, so I had a lot of time to keep my hatchet closer and then convince myself it was someone from the group getting a little antsy and stretching their legs. We talked about it on the way out and about half of us had seen the person always from about 50 yards away and everyone had thought it was someone else from the group. When I was a freshman in college I had to take a wellness class as part of our core curriculum. In my case the wellness class I took was intro to camping and hiking. The final project for our class was to go on an overnight hiking or camping excursion. A buddy and I picked a weekend again uh, before our final was due and we packed up to go camp in a nearby national park. And when we got there things seemed pretty peaceful. There was no one around in the reserved camping area which at the time we thought nothing of. We only saw one other person while we were hiking. A figure in a hoodie who waved at us from across some falls we hiked to. After hiking for a while, we decided to call it a night once it got dark. Once we got back to our tent, that's where things got interesting. We noticed a few flashlights in the woods ahead of our tent being shined in our direction. The fact that we saw flashlights wasn't an issue, but we were both bothered by the fact that multiple were concentrated in our direction. But being the burly outdoorsmen we thought ourselves to be, we grabbed our tiny hatchet we used to make kindling and approached the lights in the woods. As we got nearer, we noticed a figure holding a flashlight step towards us. I shouted to him something like, hey, you guys lost? Uh, the figure then called back, stay where you are, we're coming to help you. Being extremely confused and at this point a little frightened, my friend and I obeyed. A uh, state trooper emerged from the field of lights and questioned us about whether we had recently saw anyone in the area. My friend and I both told him about the figure we saw near the falls and the trooper's face lit up. He told us that we needed to leave the area immediately as they were searching for a fugitive who had recently crossed over state lines and was spotted near the area. Uh, they had cleared everyone out of the camp area, but since my friend and I had arrived at dusk, they did not know we were there. Apparently, the figure we had seen shot someone in a robbery gone wrong and fled once the police arrived. After learning that we had been sharing the forest with a killer, my friend and I got into our car and noped the F out of there. The one that has always stayed with me, though, was the way the guy waved at us as if he didn't have a care in the world. I used to go camping a lot, had a weird experience out in the woods. My then boyfriend and I were camping with some friends on a large piece of privately owned property inside a national forest. One of our friend's family owned the land, but nobody lived there full time. 
the property was partially cleared and the cleared acreage had a trailer house, barn equipment shed, well house, etc. It was surrounded by a barbed wire fence to keep their cattle in and a gravel road ran along the inside of the fence line. Their property extended outside the fence into uncleared forest and merged with forestry service land. We camped at the fence line. We were told not to cross the fence by ourselves and stay in the cleared area to be safe. Most of the people in our friend group were from the city and not accustomed to the forest. My boyfriend, me, and a friend of his who didn't have a tent were sleeping in my tent. I had the nylon flaps all open to let air flow through the mesh windows because it was a warm night. I was laying on an air mattress next to the back window facing the fence and forest. I woke up in the middle of the night feeling like someone was up and about, but I, I listened and didn't hear any of my other friends out of their tent. Something moving in the forest caught my eye. It was a dark human shape slowly peeking out from behind a tree and I assumed looking at the camp, it would lean away from the tree then slowly duck back behind it. It was all dark from head to where the legs disappeared into the low underbrush. I couldn't see clothes, a face, a flashlight or anything, just a dark human shape. I watched it long enough to convince myself that it wasn't a shadow and turn over to wake my boyfriend up and tell him I think somebody is out in the forest. He looked out the window but only saw some movement off in the trees and I couldn't spot it again either. He had me switch places with him so he was next to the window and we went back to sleep. The next day, nobody from our group admitted to being out of their tents overnight. It couldn't be a neighbor. They were few and far between and likely wouldn't trespass. Same with a camper or hiker. Public areas of the forest were too far away. I have no idea what I saw, but it was really weird. My birth giver moved our little family down to Butt F, nowhere, North Carolina, after my father's death. I grew up in a swampy area surrounded by cornfields, stuck with my excuse of a mother figure and her witchy interests, which always creeped me out a bit. I'm still pretty sure she had about as much witchy knowledge as a 12-year-old with a new Ouija board, but it didn't stop her from painting pentagrams on the windows with salt water to spot my protests. Anyways, a few years ago, I was around 15. I had a, had a nasty row with the birth giver and decided to take a walk. It was dark out, but I was too angry to care. I just wanted to get away and nurse my bruises and cuts in peace. So I was walking next to a road, not exactly sure where, but the road is next to a cornfield and has a whole lot of potholes. I was skirting around puddles and worn chunks of concrete, sucking the blood away from the scratches on my arms and back of my neck prickled. Of course, my dumb ass froze. I couldn't name why. My senses freak until much later. When I finally realized the creepy cries, I got felt like the weirdness. I felt my mother pulled out special candles or whatever, just a sense of wrongness. But at the moment, I dismissed that feeling and just tried to look around to see what wild animal may have been stalking me because I was all bloody. I wound up peering into the rows of corn and locking eyes with something. It was. Not right. It stood near even with the tops of the corn stalks and it seemed bulky. I very vividly remember getting immediately terrified because its eyes were reflective, but not all of its eye. It had a thick slit in the middle of the reflective area, almost like a cat's eye, but opposite. And that line thickened and widened when it saw me looking at it. I ran so damn fast. I kept stopping to vomit randomly. Every bit of me was so disgusted and viscerally horrified by those eyes. I felt like I looked right at something God had damned as unnatural. All I could think about was that, that I didn't know where I was and this thing was here and it seemed bigger than me and I was already hurt and weak. I remember making a panic joke to myself that this would make a great creative writing exercise if I lived. I genuinely expected to die. I eventually got to uh, 
gas station. So I sat by the big dumpster in the back safe with this dude that might have been on some kind of drugs. And I cried and I shook. Even as messed up as he was, he tried to calm me down. He got me to drink some water and told me not to try whatever drugs I did ever again. I wound up calling the non-emergency line on a rusty-ass telephone outside the gas station and got a cop to drive me home. Nowadays, I live elsewhere. I haven't had any experience like that again, thank God. Thinking back on it, I'm not even sure that thing, whatever it was, even moved to come after me. Sometimes the memory is fuzzy, like my mind doesn't want me to remember. And then sometimes those eyes are in nightmares and the memory is all too fresh when I wake back up. I pray about it. My husband knows of my past with my mother's witchcraft and this experience. He prays about it too. My best friend Tyler, his grandparents own 150 acres in Caldwell, Texas. We have gone hunting at night with a thermal scope on a suppressed rifle multiple times. On different occasions, we would bring one other friend out so they could shoot at pigs or coyotes. On this particular night, we brought our friend Bobby with us. Usually walking around with three people at night is loud, so Tyler decided to wait in the center of the property. Bobby and I are walking around with the thermal scope and sees absolutely nothing. After walking around for about 20, 30 minutes, we decide to let Tyler know we are heading his way. And Bobby and I get into a clearing about 200, 300 yards long. And at the end of the clearing to the left is where Tyler is at. We get about halfway through and see what looks to be a bottle rocket shoot across sky. It appeared to be a few feet long, but very skinny. The sparks that shot out of it were about four times as wide as the object and twice the length of the object. Uh, the object made no sounds whatsoever. So it shot across the sky like a bottle rocket, huge spark trail, and vanished into nothing. I look at my friend Bobby and say, what the F was that? He just looked at me and laughed and nonchalantly said that was a UFO. So at this point, I could care less about hunting and I was really interested in telling Tyler. Bobby said we shouldn't tell him because we would sound crazy. Well, sure enough, Tyler thought we were crazy. I have been hunting multiple times after that and have never seen anything like that again in my life. I've been to Bragg Road in Saratoga, Texas. It's only an hour and a half where I live. It's also called Ghost Road. Look it up. It's creepy. It's an eight mile dirt road that used to be railroad tracks back in the day. What well, night? If you're on the road, you can see what looks like train light either in front of or behind your car and it follows you. Got right up to our car from behind and scared the shit out of me. Legend has it, it's some guy looking for his head with a lantern, but it clearly looks like a train light. I don't recommend going there now. Meth heads have taken over that road and you can't drive very fast. So easy to get robbed if you aren't prepared. My husband kid and I live out in the middle of nowhere on a plot of land that's about 100 acres. I'd say probably 95 of those acres are wilderness with ATV and hiking trails that we and several of the previous owners created by exploring. We use that land for camping, hiking, and hunting. We like to spot, clear to bed, camp overnight. There's so much space. We've never stayed in the same place twice. We've seen some kill sites, both old and fresh, lots of animal tracks, places where deer bed down, etc. I've even spent a lot of time hiking solo while the kid is in school and husband's at work. Whether alone or with the family, we always carry a firearm for protection. A few weeks ago, we decided to load up our camping gear and start a new trail. We mark the trails we make with spray paint on trees. Uh, we were pretty far in the woods, having hiked almost an hour when the atmosphere seemed to change. I don't know who noticed it first, but my husband, who was leading the three of us, turned around and gave me a concerned look. The birds had stopped chirping, the insects were quiet. There were no sounds around us. 
when the woods complete quietness is rarely a good thing. We continued onward, hyper aware of our surrounds while our kid continued merrily talking. We came to the stream that marks the midway point of our property. We stopped for a few minutes, my husband and I in a stare down with each other. We both felt something was off, but didn't want to scare our daughter. I finally broke the silence and said, I suddenly didn't feel good and that we should go home. My husband nodded in agreement while our daughter voiced her protest. Too bad, kiddo. We turned around and started back. After going a few hundred yards, still in silent wilderness, I looked to my right and saw a person crouch down in a gill suit about 150 feet off our trail. I'm positive they saw that I noticed them, but they never moved. I cleared my throat to get my husband's attention, and when he looked back, I put my hand on the gun the holster on my hip, which caused him to readjust his rifle in preparation of anything. I sped up my family and we hurried back home. I told my husband as soon as we were inside. We decided to call the police and report the trespasser. Filed a report and was told to call again if we saw anyone. A few days later, my husband and I went out alone and set up a bunch of deer cams. We didn't go back out into the woods for maybe a week. Um, then he and I ventured out to retrieve the cam footage. Out of the nine cams we placed, we caught a person in a ghillie suit and two images. We handed copies over to the cops to go with our report. We haven't gone back out since except to check the deer cams, haven't got any other trespassers. It freaks me out even more to think of the few times while camping that we heard walking near our tent in the middle of the night. We always assumed it was curious animals, but now I'm not so sure. My fiance sees nightmare stuff while he's half asleep. He hates scary movies and anything like them, but he frequently has nightmares. About once a month or more, he gets up tense and ready to fight, looking intently at something across the room. Once he told me there was a big mother behind the bedroom door. Once there was a green slime coming out of the wall. Once there was a monster perched on my desk getting ready to jump at us. Every time he does this, he eventually just rolls over and goes back to sleep. Whether I gently tell him he's dreaming or not. And he remembers nothing in the morning. One night I went to bed before him. And I just had this feeling there was something under the bed. I wouldn't let my arms or feet hang off the edge of the bed and stayed burrito wrapped in my blanket. He eventually came to bed and fell asleep. Then sometime in the middle of the night, he woke me up telling me, whatever you do, don't let your feet hang off the end of the bed. If you do, they'll get ya. I weakly cried. What? He answered, they tried to cut off my hand. I didn't sleep much that night. How did we both have the feeling something was under the bed on the same night, the only time that's ever happened in our eight year relationship? So according to my family, I was a creepy as F little kid. My mom basically refuses to talk about it and claims she prayed it all away. But I mean, who knows? I don't remember any of it myself. Most of my stories are from my older sister who my mom would always talk about this stuff with. So anyways, I was around four and a half. My mom and dad had been trying for another baby for I guess around a year and a half and it wasn't happening so they basically stopped trying my mom and i were home alone one day and she was in the kitchen washing dishes or something from another room i walked in went up to her and hugged her stomach for a few seconds i then looked up at her and told her you're going to have a baby and he's going to live to be as old as i am then detached from her and walked away again she ended up being pregnant with my brother, who was then born with a birth defect that caused him to pass away when he was four and a half years old. Edit. A few people asked for more, so here's another. So well, I had an imaginary friend, Jiawa. Quick side story, I actually used to have two, but according to my sister, Jiawa, got rid of the other one. Anyways, my mom wanted me to do something at my veggies, take a bath, Something kids don't like, I don't remember. 
I got upset and told her Giawa was going to get her back tonight. She didn't think much of it, but the next morning her whole right arm was bruised up, I guess, with one even resembling someone's hand grabbing her by the arm. She has no memory of what happened, but my sister said my mom felt like she was in pain. And one more. I guess my mom and dad were in a rough patch and were seeing a counselor. Uh, the counselor told my mom that when she was really mad at him to write letters and then throw them away. So one night she got me into bed and then after a while started writing these letters my dad worked nights. I guess they were in a big fight. So my mom wrote a good amount of letters that night. She would write one, crumple it up, and then throw it behind her into the trash. Fast forward to the morning. My mom was making me breakfast and I was sitting at the table and there wasn't anything in front of me, no paper or anything. But I started doing these motions like I was crumpling something up and throwing it behind me. She asked what I was doing and I told her I, I was doing what she was doing last night, the night before she was in her room with the door locked. No way I could see. This happened a week or so ago. I don't know exactly what time it was, but it was dark. I live on a farm. I was walking home after putting our farm animals to bed when I passed an old, practically fallen down barn on our property. And it's in bad condition. It nearly collapsed on my mother once upon a time. I glanced at the barn as I neared it and witnessed a huge bulky, maybe winged thing duck away into the barn incredibly fast. It seemed to me like it cowered away. When I looked at it, like it didn't want to be caught watching me. It was huge, seemingly too big, fit through the large open window at the front of the barn where it appeared to be perched. Its eyes were tiny and glistening white. Once I saw the thing, I ran as fast as I could from my house. I felt a sensation that made me feel like something was rushing towards me incredibly, but never reaching me. That's the only way I can explain it. I still don't like going outside on my mom when it's dark, and that bat barn freaks me out a bit. Once in a while, I hear noises from seemingly within it. Uh, sounds like somebody setting down a pile of wooden planks over and over. It could be an echo from elsewhere on the property, but I don't know. I also feel like it may have just been my mind playing tricks on me, but it seemed too unnaturally real. I feel like the barn is watching me whenever I pass it. In the spring or summer of 2003, 2004, or 2005, right after my retirement at the end of 2002, I started volunteering with the Leon County Florida Red Cross we had just received a federal state grant to assess the readiness of neighboring counties for any potential terrorist attacks. On these assessment trips, Red Cross personnel and volunteers, usually 10 to 20 of us, would travel in a rented Greyhound bus to the designated county. Our usual departure time was around 8 a.m. from Leon County. One particular morning, we were traveling east along I-10. I found myself seated alone slightly behind the middle of the bus on the right side next to the window. I wasn't engaged in any activities, not reading, not listening to anything, nor conversing with anyone as we journeyed through either Eastern Jefferson County or Western Madison County. My attention was caught by an airplane overtaking the bus from behind. It was a substantial jet airliner, although I couldn't recall any specific markings. A strange thing was, it seemed to be descending as if preparing to land. However, I knew there were no airports in that vicinity that could accommodate a plane of that size. Behind a tree line, the plane was fully visible due to the absence of any underbrush. I prepared myself for the worst, expecting a crash. However, as our bus advanced, leaving the plane behind, I neither saw nor heard any signs of a crash. It was perplexing given that we were close enough to hear an explosion had one occurred. I looked around the bus, but no one else appeared to have noticed the peculiar incident. Everyone was engaged in their own activities, reading, chatting, or simply lost in their own thoughts. I chose not to share what I'd witnessed, not wanting to cause any unnecessary alarm. 
Later that evening, I recounted the incident to my husband and kept an eye on the news to see if there had been any reports of a plane crash in the area. My husband, however, didn't have much to say. I suppose he didn't want to offend me by suggesting that I might have been hallucinating. But I knew what I saw, and it remains an unexplained mystery to this day. It was a beautiful sunny afternoon, and I decided to take my young children to a nearby cave for a little adventure. The cave was a popular spot known for its stunning stalactites and stalagmites, but on this day, we were lucky to have the place to ourselves. And the cave was spacious and airy, allowing plenty of sunlight to filter in, illuminating our path. We made our way through, splashing in the occasional puddle, pointing out interesting rock formations, and echoing our voices off the cavernous walls. The cave tunnel took about 30 minutes to traverse and ended in a small, narrow exit. However, due to the muddy conditions, we decided to turn around and head back the way we had come. About halfway back through the cave, I noticed something unusual. There was a candle burning brightly placed about eight feet up on one side of the cave wall. My heart skipped a beat. I was certain it hadn't been there when we first passed through. I felt a surge of protective instinct. There was likely someone else in the cave hidden in the shadows. I quickly gathered my children close, keeping them between myself and the cave wall. I tried to appear calm, not wanting to alarm them. As we cautiously moved forward, my eyes strained to penetrate the dimness, searching for any sign of movement. And then just as we were near the mouth of the cave, we saw it. Silhouetted against the sunlight streaming in from the entrance was a massive figure, easily over eight feet tall. It was covered in thick, matted hair from head to toe, and it stood on two legs like a man. But its arms were much longer, reaching almost to its knees. For a moment, it stood there, unmoving, seemingly as surprised to see us as we see it. I realized then that we were staring at a creature of legend, a Bigfoot. The moment passed and the creature turned, disappearing into the dense forest surrounding the cave entrance. We hurried out into the daylight, our hearts pounding. We didn't stop moving until we had put a good distance between ourselves and the cave. Even now, years later, we still talk about that day. The day we ventured into a cave and came face to face with a creature from our wildest imaginations. It was a sighting that transformed an ordinary outing into an extraordinary memory. Years ago, I lived in a forest in a tiny house with a flat roof. It might sound unbelievable as in horror movies, but close to our house was a land with housing for people in bad mental condition. As a social worker, I'm not scared because of it at all. And I think it's really nice. We were all lucky to live in the middle of beautiful nature. One night, I was home alone. I drank my drink and smoked my smoke. But those days when I heard something walking over the roof of the house, first a louder booth like a jump, some weird running around. That over and over and over. I like fantasy, thriller, splatter, sci-fi, but believe me, not when you feel like you're in the middle of that. It was hard to escape the sound. I didn't want to go outside in the deepest night. So I laid under my blanket, hoping it would stop or I would fall asleep. But I couldn't. Then I heard the blinds and realized I left my window open. I started to hear my heart beat in my head, then some scratching behind the TV. Even though my lights were still on, uh, kept my eyes powerfully shut. And then there was that one moment I thought, I can lay here waiting to get murdered or at least do my best and scare back. I crawled out under my blanket, took my guitar as some sort of damaging baseball bat and shuffled towards the TV. I heard the scratching and saw water coming out under the TV table. Whatever that was behind the TV was about to get squished between the wall and my guitar. I did a Conan the Barbarian pose and pressed the guitar behind my TV to be shot with the most terrible scream ever. I froze. And there he was. A big fat red cat finally flew next to my head towards the blinds straight out of the window. 
I never knew I could be this retarded. They should have brought me to the land for people in bad mental condition. My husband's extended family lives in New Brunswick while his parents moved to Ontario and raised their kids here. Eventually, my in-laws retired back to New Brunswick about 1,400 kilometers away. So my husband's maternal grandmother was sick for a while. His parents got the call one night that she had taken a turn for the worse and to come right away. They literally packed and left Ontario right away and were driving down across an old, old logging highway in the middle of New Brunswick. See my older posts for a short gif of the desolate road when a moose ran onto the road and reared in front of their car. They stopped the car and the moose walked up to the windows and looked into the cab, literally leaving breath on the windows. Eventually, it walked away. They get to the hospital in the middle of the night only to find out that grandma passed away exactly at that time. Fast forward 30 years. My husband's mom is terminally ill. Her kids and grandkids have convened in New Brunswick for her last days. For several days before her death, we come home from the hospital to find moose tracks in the driveway, especially around the windows of the house. My husband's cousin has to go back to Ontario and leaves the hospital to get ready. Within an hour of this, my husband's mom had passed away. 15 minutes after her passing, I get a text from his cousin, a picture of a moose standing beside their garage. Never before or after has anyone seen a moose in the yard. While out a hiking in the middle of the night with my friends in California, we came across a mountain lion. We were headed down the mountain, my friend at the front, another one of my friends in the middle, and myself in the back. The front friend suddenly stopped and asked, did you guys hear that? I thought he was joking, but asked what? Anyway, consequently I looked to my left off the trail and saw glowing eyes staring back at me about 15, 20 feet away. I pushed the button on my headlamp to make it shine brighter and saw the silhouette of a mountain lion. We all stared at it in fear and it stared back. Finally, I called out and raised my arms above my head, hey lion, in an attempt to scare it away. This next part, I'll never forget. I blinked exactly once and very slowly like how common housemate blink. Then it turned away and we couldn't see it anymore. All the way down the mountain, we shouted random things to scare it away if it was even still following us. We even had a conversation on while shouting just to keep our minds off it. On you, we were terrified. I remember every 20 seconds or so, I would check behind us and scan the area to see if it was following us. Also, myself and the friend in the front had our knives drawn as if my little Leatherman would have made a difference in the event of an attack. Knowing that mountain lions attack their prey from behind and with myself being in the back of the group, my friend very well could have saved my life. I like to explore and there's some woods by my house that my neighbors gave me permission I go in. So they know I go there. Sometimes just to walk or to explore with friends. So there's this old bridge that somehow was knocked down and I enjoy going there. So one day I figure I'll make a cool video edit of it. So I ride my bike to the Greenway by the creek. It's uh, and I start down and everything is fine. I get to the fence line that's down. Hop it so I have permission here. So I push my bike a bit farther than unload, leaving my bike hidden with my pack. Not sure why hidden, but A, don't want anything to happen to it. So I start to walk to the bridge with two GoPros, one on a chesty, another on a selfie stick. I get there, take some cool pictures and video. I'm finishing up and realize, crap, I didn't get B-roll. So I start recording. Again, just getting standard shots. When all of a sudden, I hear a truck or UTB pull up, which I thought was weird. Since my neighbors were not home and it's an overgrown grass lane leading to the bridge, also you can't see the bridge from the road. Also, my neighbors would have seen me enter their property. 
So I start to leave since I have no idea who it is. And I heard them beep. I can hear it on the video. So I hide behind a pine tree. I know smart. Then someone yells, hey. At this point, I just run to my bike and leave. I still have no idea who it was. And the last time I went back alone, I got weird feeling and left. Also not the only strange thing that happened to me here. It was early in the morning and I was on a road when I noted the creature standing in the middle of the road 100 feet away. It stared at me curiously, then started shaking its arms and fists at it and uh, the thought thought that might be a sign of intelligence. I glanced away and when I looked back, the creature was gone. There was a lot of three foot high grass and might have died behind a berm. The sun was behind the creature, so I only saw the silhouette, no facial features. It was about seven foot tall, with a great big chest and long arms, and covered with six or seven inch hair color unknown. The creature had a five inch long neck and a roundish head. Uh, there was also a horrible smell associated with the sighting. The Deschutes National Forest in this area is covered with lodgepole pine trees with little brush or ground clutter. This story takes place when I was about nine or 10. I'm 22 now. My mom took me fishing after school. I assume it was a weekend, not sure now. I, we went to a local reservoir that's maybe 10 minutes out of town. We live in Illinois, and the tiny town we live in used to pump water from this creek into the reservoir. I guess to keep the water level up. Anyway, me and my mom finished fishing and are getting ready to go home. And this reservoir is up on hill that you have to take these old iron stairs up the hill past an old pump house that's gone now. I think we were just about at the top of stairs getting ready to make the descent back to the turn off from the highway. My mom pointed out this long thing going down the creek. It was about three or four car lengths long and maybe the width of a car. Mongo's is the A tree because what was stinking out of the water was green. However, it starts moving kind of like a large fish. I saw what looked like uh, the rear fin on a fish raise up out of the water as it was almost past. I told my mom I was scared to go to the car because I was scared of whatever that creature was in my 10 year old mind. I thought it was an alligator or something. She told me that it couldn't get out of the water and that made me feel better about going down the hill to the car. I've never seen a fish that large in my life again, Ellie. My mom mentioned the story to me again recently and this made me decide to do my own research. My uncle said it was most likely a river carp but I've looked at pictures of river carp and what we saw was like eight times the length of a record breaking size carp caught in the area. And the creek I found out is called Spring Creek and it connects to the Sangamon River and the onto the Mississippi River. Now, I've heard reports of bull sharks being seen at St. Louis, which is about one hour away by interstate, but I have no idea what would have been in the creek, which was large and decently wide. And I'm assuming deep since I threw rocks in it on later fishing trips and they made a large splash in the murky brown water. I have no idea what it was to this day, but it's so large and moved, meaning it wasn't a tree or other object. I still have no explanation about what it could have been. I've been to the reservoir in the creek several times over the years and never saw anything like it again. It was daytime during this. I'm assuming around 7 p.m. at night during early fall, as it was after school and it was sunny. The reservoir is now unused as the town now gets water from a close by city now and the water level has dropped drastically. It's now about 10 feet more shallow now and I've even been able to walk through the middle once with friends when we were looking for a place to smoke. I've been a part of many classified missions during my time in the special forces but one particular operation stands out as the most unsettling and inexplicable experience of my career it was a mission that took us deep into a remote dense forest far removed from civilization and into the very heart of the unknown 
on the forest was unlike any I had ever encountered before. A place of eerie silence and perpetual twilight. It was as if the very trees conspired to hold their breath, as if they were privy to secrets that the rest of the world was not meant to know. My team moved through the dense undergrowth with the utmost caution, every footstep echoing ominously in the stillness. As we ventured further into the forest, unsettling occurrences began to unfold around us. Strange figures seemed to lurk in the shadows just beyond the edge of our vision. They moved with an otherworldly grace, their forms shrouded in a surreal haze. At times we heard whispers that seemed to come from nowhere, carried on the faintest breath of wind. On one fateful day, as the sun cast long shadows across the forest floor, we encountered the creature that would forever haunt our nightmares. It emerged from the depths of the woods, a monstrous apparition that defied all reason. The creature stood at an imposing height, probably about eight feet tall. Its body was a dark gray with hints of brown, and its presence exuded an air of primal menace. It had a mane of hair that resembled that of a male lion, albeit shorter around the body and legs. But the most unnerving aspect was the way it moved. Upright on its back legs, like a grotesque fusion of man and beast. As the creature locked eyes with us, a primal instinct of fear surged through our ranks. We opened fire, bullets tearing through the stillness of the forest, but the creature was unfazed. It roared with a guttural fury that rattled our very souls, and with a speed that belied its size, it vanished into the wilderness, leaving us stunned and trembling. We searched the area where the creature had been, our nerves on edge, but there was no sign of it. It was as though the forest itself had swallowed the creature whole, leaving behind only the echoes of its chilling roar. In the aftermath of that encounter, our team was left shaken and bewildered. We questioned the very nature of the world we thought we knew. Was this creature a product of some secret experiment or manifestation of the untamed wilderness? We may never know the answer. On July 11, 2020, at approximately 22 hours, in Schuylkill Heaven, Pennsylvania, my son and I were on top of the roof after observing the local fireworks show. The fireworks had ended five plus minutes prior to this. He was positioning his camera towards the constellation of the Big Dipper, Asia Major, in order to photograph Comet Noah's. I noticed something moving. The object, as best as I can describe it, was the shape of a monta ray as you would see it in the ocean, looking at its underbelly from below the creature. This object moved quite fast from right to left, almost directly above us. My son then saw the object and turned attempting to photograph it. I lost sight of the object after only maybe three seconds of seeing it move, but he said he saw the object make a turn and backtrack toward where it came from before losing sight of it. We both described the object as almost translucent with no visible lights at all. Earlier, I was flying my Typhoon drone to photograph the fireworks, so the size was similar, but moving much faster. I'm unsure if the object was 300 plus feet above us or higher and larger than the drone, though the speed tells me it was lower. Again, this was not a drone or any type of aircraft. It made no noise and had no visible wings. The entire episode lasted maybe three, five seconds. By the way, I have been a police officer in this town for over 20 years. In the spring of 2009, I was sent to Chechen with my platoon to fight the enemy using unconventional means. Our mission was to divert supply lines and gather intelligence by talking to villagers. I remember how rainy and foggy it was during that time of year. One night, while retrieving a cache of buried weapons, my team noticed some lights in the forest. We could see them with the naked eye, but they were quite far off. It appeared to be ten small lights, all moving erratically. I then noticed what sounded like voices or whispers. It sounded like two people speaking Chechen. It was very quiet at first, but it started to gain in frequency until it sounded like they were whispering right next to my ear. Soon, ten more voices joined in the whispering, all speaking at once. 
I began to panic, fearing that we had been made. I thought maybe the lights were a distraction, a common tactic used by Chechen soldiers, and we would be ambushed. My teammate and good friend Ivan suddenly started speaking loudly as if he was trying to communicate with his father, who had died two years earlier. He started to run towards the light, dropping his gun and his pack. I assumed that he had lost it or the enemy was playing with our minds, fearing for my friend and worrying he might give up our position. I chased after him. Ivan just kept repeating, I'm coming, father. He was in a dead sprint running towards the light. As we got closer and the lights got bigger, I found it odd that I could make out no definition in them. Nobody or nothing was behind them. They just looked like lights floating in midair. That was strange to me, I recalled. Ivan, now on his knees, arms at his side, was in front of a body of water, directly in front of the lights. He seemed to be in trance and despite my attempts. I couldn't believe what was happening before my eyes. My friend Ivan seemed to be in a trance, talking to his father in the strange lights in front of us, despite my attempts to snap him out of it. In that moment, my only concern was to avoid getting shot. Eventually, the commander arrived and looked at Ivan, and the lights before muttering, the fairies have him. I had never considered anything paranormal before, and I didn't know what to make of it. Ivan eventually passed out, and when I looked back up from his body, the lights were gone. It was terrifying. We carried Ivan back to our original location, but he had no memory of what happened. It was like he was in a coma, and he couldn't remember anything from that day. The experience was extremely weird, and it's the strangest event ever happened in my entire life. Looking back, I believe that the lights had sinister intentions for us, possibly trying to lure Ivan to the water to drown him. The next day, we just nodded at each other and carried on with the missions. In the end, I became disenchanted with the Russian military and exchanged important information with United States officials. As a result, I was granted citizenship and now live in the United States, having cut off all ties with my family. I have resumed my career as an infantryman now as an American. A um, friend and I were walking up the Phantom Trail and about 100 yards into it, I saw what appeared to me as a Bigfoot impression right in the middle of the trail. There was no doubt as to what it was. And as my friend caught up with me, I asked him if he saw what I saw. There was no doubt in his mind of what he saw seeing either. The print was about 14, 16 inches long, but what impressed me was the width, which was about six, eight inches, just below the toes. We walked about a mile up and continued to see these prints. I was armed with a .45 automatic and my friend with a nine millimeter, so we felt safe, but continued slowly with no smells or incidents. After about a mile, I noticed another set of prints, only smaller, come right into the trail. This kind of made my friend and I a little more nervous. About 20 feet later, a third set appeared. This set was a little smaller than the second, but we were sure that it was a third. At this time, we decided to turn back. We smelled nothing, heard nothing, but felt as if there was a presence that knew we were there. It was a Saturday night, and I was hanging out at the bar with my friends having a great time. We were all talking about how our lives have been since we last saw each other a few years ago. They all told me how they got some boring good paying jobs, but I'm right where I want to be at. I do photography and fell in love with it when I was a kid. It took me a few years to get above average pay, which was a pain, but I still love what I do. We all exchanged numbers later that night and left Walking to my car, I got a text from my boss about a new project he wants me to do. The theme was nature, and I was lucky since my house is right next to a forest. I responded that I was down to do this project. It was really late at night, around 2 a.m., and I decided to go into my backyard and see where I will be going tomorrow. Draco, my four-year-old lab, was barking and whining to go outside. I got some food for him so we could relax in the backyard. 
I was on my phone scrolling through my social media apps, minding my own business until Draco began to viciously bark towards the woods. Draco, come over here. I yelled out. He ran back towards me quick as a rabbit. I could tell he was in fear of what he had seen. I began to comfort him and investigated the woods to see if I could see what was scary him. All I saw were six bright white dots looking toward me, but I couldn't make out what it was. It must have been the raccoons. Uh, they're always out by my house and the woods. I shouted out to the things to go away, but they did not budge. Draco and I went back inside and I kept a close eye on the woods the whole way. We went to bed because it was late and I had to see my boss in the afternoon. I woke up and looked around because I had an ugly sense that someone was watching me. I looked at Draco and he had a dead stare looking out the window. I slowly turned my head towards the door to see the same bright white dots, but I could make out that they were the eyes of some creature, not a raccoon, but something else. They slowly started to fade away into the darkness. I turned to the other side of my bed and I saw them right in front of me. They looked like tall humans, but it was too dark to see any other details. They suddenly jumped at me and that's when I woke up. This is all just a terrible nightmare. I brushed it off and went to go feed Draco before I left to see my boss. And for some odd reason, Draco would just stare at the woods for a few good minutes, then just go back to laying down. I couldn't investigate because of time, so I laughed and made my way to work. My boss, Derek, told me to meet him at a coffee shop near my house so we could talk about what he wanted some pictures of. I need you to get some good shots of our forest. I know you live in one, basically so. This shouldn't be hard, he said. I left and went to go get ready for the job. I had to stop at a store to get the right lens for this job in particular. Hopefully the nighttime shot can be quick because I don't feel safe going in there alone. By the time I found the right lens, it was already 5 p.m. in daytime. It began to fall into the night. The sunset looked amazing. So I snapped a shot. On my way home, I was wondering how Draco was doing. I mean, why would he keep staring outside for a few minutes before laying down? Was there someone out there when I got home, Draco was sleeping, and it seemed as if everything was the same as I had left it. I let Draco outside, and I went to take some shots of the forest before nighttime hit. I got a good 30 pictures in them, just random things, and decided to take good ones tomorrow with more sunlight. Since it was already night time, I decided to take the night pictures today to get them over with. I had a fear of stepping in the woods ever since I had that nightmare last night, but it was my job and I needed to get it done quickly. I went back to the house to let Draco inside and to get my other lens for the night shots. It was 8 p.m. and the light of the sun disappeared while night struck the sky. The stars were out and I had to get a good angle with the trees and have the stars in the background. I walked a little further and saw a trail leading down. I went over and noticed it led to a massive cave. It was dark and the only source of light that I had was the flashlight from my phone. I flashed over to the cave to see if I could see anything before I went inside. I wanted to look around first. As I was walking away, I heard the sound of something moving inside the cave. It sounded as if it was getting closer and trying to leave the cave. I did not want to know what was coming up from inside. So I ran down the trail to where the campers are normally. When I got there, I went up to the main I see every day. Hey, I know you don't know me, but do you know about that cave back there down the trail? I said, I'm out of breath waiting for a response. What do you want to know about it? He asked very confusedly. I work for a photography company and I want to take some pictures inside there, but I heard something moving around. Do you know anything about it? I asked him, if you're going in there for some pictures, then you might as well take your death photo while you're at it, he said, seeming mad. I just shrugged and went back to the cave to uh, take a few pictures and leave. On my way there, I tripped on something and fell over. I turned my flashlight on to see what I had stepped on. It was a large footprint. Um, it had to be roughly 20 inches 
long it led to the cave along with several other footprints, I knew there was something big and I had to get a picture of it. I made my way to the cave entrance. Inside it was dark and silent, just the beat of my heart echoed through the large cave. I took a single picture with Lash on. I checked the picture and put the exposure up to see where the next entry will be. I went to the opening on the right and took another picture and did the same as the last time. When I checked the picture, I saw the bright white eyes and when I put the exposure up, I could see humanoid figures standing there watching me. I looked into the darkness and they were standing right in front of me. I had to look up at them and I didn't move a single muscle. Something behind them fell down, the sound of rocks falling over. The eyes turned around and behind them were more bright white eyes popping out of nowhere. I went back to where I came from until I saw the dim light from outside. When I made it out, I ran straight to my house and called my boss immediately. I sent him the picture and he was in shock at what I got a hold of. I work as a ranger at the Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona and let me tell you, it's an incredible job. Not only do I get to witness the breathtaking beauty of nature, but I also have the opportunity to meet fascinating people from all walks of life. The park management takes great care of our accommodations, uh, ensuring that our rooms and stations are comfortable and well-maintained. They even renovate them every year before the massive tourist rush, and the meals they provide are not only delicious, but also fulfilling. I genuinely love my job, you may be aware that the Grand Canyon National Park shares a boundary with the Navajo region. As I patrol that side of the park, visitors often ask me if I've had any strange experiences or if the Navajo people are spooky. According to our training sessions and briefings, the Navajo prefer to keep to themselves, which is why I haven't encountered them near the park. Or at least I hadn't until the other day. It happened when I saw an older Navajo man, around 70 years old, near the park. He had a hunchback and was dressed in the typical Native American attire. Curious and concerned, I approached him and asked if he needed any assistance with navigation. He appeared lost, but as soon as I spoke, his eyes opened wide and he grabbed my hands with an unexpectedly strong grip that even caused me some discomfort. I didn't expect the old man to possess such strength. With a firm hold on my hands, he pulled me closer, so we were staring directly into each other's eyes. His voice became hushed, and he spoke in a mysterious tone. He informed me that he had been searching for me since that morning and had only just found me. Bewildered, I asked if I knew him, but he dismissed that question as irrelevant. What he said next sent chills down my spine. He claimed he was seeking me out to warn me about my impending death. I was left speechless, unable to comprehend what he was saying. I repeatedly asked him who he was trying to make sense of the situation. At that moment, I thought he must be delusional, given his age and the fantastical nature of his words. I shrugged off his warning and decided to guide him back to the gate that led to the Navajo region. As we approached the gate, I noticed some other Native Americans waiting for the old man. To my surprise, as soon as they saw him with me, they rushed toward us and swiftly whisked the old man away. Their speed and urgency made me wonder what was really going on. I watched them disappear into the distance and return to my daily duties, dismissing the encounter as an eccentricity of the old man. The rest of the day was uneventful, except for helping a couple who had lost their child in the park. Thankfully, we located the child after a thorough search after sunset, I went back to my unit, took a break, ate some food, and tried to relax. I was lying on my bed, engrossed in a book when I heard a distant shriek. Although faint, it caught my attention, and I instinctively turned towards my radio, anticipating a message about the sound. But the radio remained silent. I waited for a few more moments, but there was no response. Shrugging it off as perhaps a trick of the wind, I returned to my reading. However, the same sound echoed through the night, this time louder and closer. Without hesitation, I sprang to my feet, already preparing myself for action. I thought maybe I was the only one who heard it. 
which seemed strange. Leaving my firearm behind, I rushed outside following the direction from which the sound seemed to originate. It was a dark night, and the silence intensified the rustling noises that came from a distance. The shriek echoed once again, this time sounding like an injured animal in distress. I proceeded cautiously, moving slowly toward the source of the sound. As I neared the spot, my heart raced and a chill ran down my spine. Something emerged from behind a tree and I struggled to find words to describe what I saw. It was a figure bent down on all fours, growling with drool dripping from its mouth. Instinctively, I reached for my flashlight and directed its beam toward the creature. What I saw in that moment sent shivers through my entire being. The creature hissed and locked its black, menacing eyes onto mine. Its gaze pierced through me, leaving me paralyzed with fear. I turned on my heels and sprinted back toward the safety of the ranger station. Panic consumed me as I realized I had left my firearm inside, but there was no time to retrieve it. The only thought on my mind was reaching the station and securing myself inside. I barged into the station, slamming the door shut behind me. I made my way to the security room and quickly checked the surveillance cameras. One of the cameras focused on the area outside the station, and to my horror, it revealed the creature chewing on something. I couldn't make out the details, but its inhuman actions sent a shiver down my spine. I remained inside the station, glued to the monitors, until the creature disappeared from sight, moving away on all fours. Only then did I double check all the cameras to ensure it was truly gone. Feeling a mix of relief and lingering unease, I stepped outside and hurried straight to my room, locking the door behind me. By the following day, I gathered the other rangers and shared the harrowing experience with them. We reviewed the recordings from the previous night and their reactions mirror my own fear and disbelief. From that moment on, we became extra vigilant during our shifts, especially during the night. However, the creature never made another appearance, leaving us to question the nature of what we had encountered. But what haunted me even more was the memory of the old man who had warned me. His words echoed in my mind, refusing to fade away. Had he known about the creature? Was there any truth to the stories he had shared? I couldn't shake off the sense of foreboding that lingered within me. Now, as a ranger at the Grand Canyon National Park, I remain on high alert, keeping a watchful eye on the surrounding wilderness. The beauty of the park continues to captivate visitors, but deep within me, I know that there are mysteries and dangers lurking just beyond the veil of its majestic landscapes. And as I continue my duties, I hold on to the memory of that encounter a constant reminder to stay vigilant and respect the unknown forces that may dwell within the shadows of the Grand Canyon. I'm choosing to remain anonymous for this account. I was driving eastbound on Pleasant Hill Road about one and a half miles west of Highway 164 in Richfield when something caught my attention on the side of the road. Curiosity peaked. I decided to slow down and take a closer look. I stepped out of my car, shining my flashlight into the darkness, and that's when I noticed something in the trees. Two large eyes were staring back at me, positioned high above the ground. It took me a few seconds to trace those eyes down to what appeared to be legs. The creature stood there motionless, illuminated by the light reflecting off its eyes. As I observed the figure, I couldn't help but notice its towering height well over seven feet. It was covered in fine hair and had long arms and proportionally large legs. The creature stood upright like a person but had the legs of a dog. Strangely, there was no sound at all, just complete silence surrounding this enigmatic being. After observing it for several seconds, I returned to my car and drove off fully convinced of what I had just witnessed. I can say with 100% certainty that it was not a bear or anything similar. Having encountered bears during my off-duty bear hunting excursions, I was familiar with their appearance. This creature had a distinct canine-like resemblance that set it apart. And the area where this incident occurred is known for unexplained sounds, including peculiar cries and screams emanating from the forest. Interestingly, 
A close friend of mine also reported seeing two large figures with fur in the same vicinity. These figures were standing uh, near a tree on the south side of the road, close to the shoulder. The road in that area is curvy, and my friend noticed eye shine from these figures. He estimates that he observed them for about three seconds as his headlights illuminated the scene. He, too, is absolutely certain that he witnessed something unusual. Overwhelmed by the experience, he immediately called me while still driving. Around 45 minutes after his call, I joined him, and we returned to the site. We brought our dog along, but every time we approached the area where the sighting occurred, our dog started whimpering and refused to go any closer. As we neared the spot, something suddenly startled us from behind. A loud growl emerged from a single location next to the road, then moved into the nearby trees, where it seemed like two animals were engaged in a fierce fight for about five seconds. We were taken aback by these disturbing sounds. It felt as though the creature or creatures were displaying aggression. We decided not to proceed further and stood there for a while, listening to the eerie silence of the woods. Realizing that we needed to leave the area swiftly, we quickly got back into our vehicle and drove away at top speed, making sure we were out of the vicinity in case any more disturbances occurred. I called my friend as we sped down the road seeking solace in the fact that the noises had ceased. I appreciate you taking the time to read this lengthy account. I wanted to ensure that you had all the information necessary to understand our experiences. I was a mountain guide in Southern Colorado last year. One mountain is notorious for the baby doll man. High elevation, pretty deep in the back country, is this parcel of private land that our company passes close by on the way to summit this particular mountain. All on the property there are baby dolls hanging from nooses, impaled doll heads on pikes, and random doll limbs stacked in piles. One of my god friends tells this story. One week he was hiking with a particular group that happened to be really slow. And he was indeed leading them up baby doll mountain. Since this group was so slow, they had barely made it to the usual campsite that we take them to before the summon attempt early the next morning, by this time the sun was setting. So our friend decided to camp with the group further down the trail, pretty close to the baby doll men's house. On summit day morning, he wakes up at 4 a.m. because that's how early you need to get up to summit a mountain with slow people. It is pitch black and he shines his headlight around his tent. The tent is outlined with baby doll parts. When I was about 18, I was sitting in a blind after dark trying to trap owls with a couple other people who were falconers. We were about half a mile or so from the nearest road in a clearing in the woods. It was pitch black all around, and we only had a red light on inside the blind. The blind is about 12 by 12 by 8, there's three small, singular holes in each wall, but no other windows or anything, and a closed door. All of a sudden, bright light is coming in from all the different sides of the blind at once. We all start quietly freaking out. My first thought was a police helicopter looking for drug growers, but there was no sound. As soon as it went dark, we ran outside, and there was nothing around and no sound. Can't explain that one, and I think I imagined it if I wasn't alone. A second one was a couple years ago. I was deer hunting in the mountains. I was walking up a trail up to a peak in a fairly remote area. I left my car at around 4 a.m. to start hiking. I could hear nosies in the woods most of the way up, but never saw anything, and that's not really unusual. When I was hunting, I saw two guys come out the trail I had hiked in. I was just sitting looking through binoculars, so when they got close, I waved and started talking to them. They asked how long I had been up there, and I told them it was about 10 a.m. at this point. Then they asked if I saw all the wolf tracks on the path. No, there hadn't been any wolf tracks. So on the way back down, I was watching the trail, starting about 100 yards down from the peak. I started seeing wolf tracks and scat, some of them even in my boot prints. 
There was about seven or eight individuals, and the tracks overlapped mine starting right after leaving my car. Turns out they were what I had been hearing all the way up the mountain. That still freaks me out. The vastness of the Pacific Ocean seemed endless as our United States Special Forces elite team embarked on a routine naval exercise. We were trained to handle a multitude of scenarios, but little did we know that the most unexpected and harrowing encounter of our lives was about to unfold. As we sailed through the calm waters, our eyes caught sight of an ominous sight on the horizon. An abandoned cargo ship drifting aimlessly. Our curiosity peaked, we decided to investigate. A sense of trepidation crept up my spine as we boarded the derelict vessel, not knowing what to expect. The ship's interior was eerie, a ghostly echo of its former activity. Dust and cobwebs covered everything, and a stifling atmosphere hung in the air. But it was not the ship's emptiness that alarmed us. It was the cargo we discovered below deck. There, in the dim light, stood a creature that defied all logic and explanation. It was taller than any of us, easily dwarfing a pickup truck by a couple of feet. Its bones were encased in a haunting contrast of black and white, long arms half stretched to its sides as if it was daring us to challenge it. This cryptic creature was like nothing we had encountered before. Three-dimensional and imposing, it exuded an aura of deathly stillness. It seemed to absorb light around it, not reflecting anything in return. A deer skull formed its nightmarish face, void of expression yet evoking an unshakable sense of malevolence. Before we could fully process the enigma before us, the creature lunged at our team with unimaginable speed and ferocity. Chaos erupted as we struggled to defend ourselves against this formidable adversary. The creature's attack caught us off guard and inflicted injuries on several of our soldiers. Instinct and training kicked in and we retaliated with a hail of gunfire. The bullets hit the creature, causing it to roar in pain and anger, but it wasn't enough to bring it down. Despite our efforts, the cryptid managed to escape by leaping into the sea, disappearing beneath the waves with an eerie, vanishing act. We rushed to the ship's deck, hoping to catch a glimpse of creature's retreat, but it was as if it had never been there. The ocean lay calm and undisturbed, leaving us to wonder if the encounter had been a mere hallucination. As a Special Forces team, we were accustomed to facing danger head on, but this encounter left us shaken to our core. We knew we had encountered something beyond the realm of our understanding, a cryptid that defied all known laws of nature. It was an average summer day for us 10 year olds in Northern Illinois. It was a day just like any other before it. We saw the same people, we watched the same cars drive by, and we heard the same animals making the same noises they always make. There we were, the four of us, taking a break from playing basketball, and for some reason, I looked up, and there it was the biggest bird I had ever seen flying out of the western sky, but I wasn't sure it really was a bird. When I first saw it, I was certain it was one of those custom-made biplanes that was just made to look like a bird. However, I noticed there wasn't any noise coming from its engines. That's when the beast's wings flapped. It was at that time I realized I was actually staring at a bird bigger than any I had ever seen in my life. I shouted at my three friends to look up partly so they could see this giant bird and partly so I'd have someone to tell me if I was seeing things or not. At the time, I wasn't sure if any of them did look up. My eyes were fixed on the bird. I continued to watch it as it flew over my house, then off into the eastern sky. The entire sighting was only about 30 seconds, but those 30 seconds were etched into my mind forever. And the bird itself was probably around 6 to 10 feet in length. As for its wingspan, I am certain that it was at least around 25 feet, maybe bigger. It was a dark brown color with no other marks that I could see. One thing that stands out in my mind is its huge claws I had seen both vultures and birds of prey's claws, and something about these made me think of a bird of prey. The only part of the bird that I didn't get a good look at was its head. 
All I can remember seeing is its beak. And that was only for a brief moment. As for the other three witnesses, I am certain that two of them saw the bird too. As for the third one, he wasn't around when I looked to see if anyone else was present after the bird was out of my view. As for one of the other witnesses, at the time of the sighting, and for a while after it, he agreed that we saw a rather large bird, but a couple of months after the sighting, he said he didn't remember seeing anything. As for the fourth witness, he has always agreed that we saw a giant bird that day. He remembers it being a dark color, but isn't sure which color because the sun was in his eyes from his viewpoint. One thing we don't agree on about the bird is its size. He thinks it was slightly bigger, around 12 feet with a wingspan of about 30 feet. That sighting was seven years ago, 1995, and to this day, I'm not sure what it was. I know it wasn't a vulture or a hawk of some kind because I see those all the time around here. After reading about Thunderbirds, I believe that's what it was. I just wish I could get a glimpse of it again. Well then, I can be certain if all I saw was my imagination taking over for a moment or a truly massive bird roaming the Midwestern skies. On February 27th, 2023, my friend was driving home from work and passing down my country road sometime between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. Less than a mile from my house at the end of my township, within a thousand feet of the closest house, he saw an unknown creature. It was at the edge of the road as if we were about to cross. It was pitch black, very furry, and had a bobtail and the face of a pit bull. I could see its jowls. It had dog-like ears, slender but muscular, and was standing on all fours. When it saw me, it paid no attention to me, but slowly turned around and leaped back into the woods. When it leaped, it jumped like a frog. Its legs were turned out just like a frog. It was appropriately the size of a Great Dane on all fours. He was uncertain if it had humanoid feet and couldn't identify much else. Where he reported having seen it in a wooded area right beside a small bayou, you southern Louisiana, and there is a notable nook that leads off into the woods right around where he saw it. The very same night after he saw it, I heard strange noises around midnight, akin to something climbing a wooden structure, thuds, and the sound of wood bowing. Side. Events. Six or so years ago, I saw something strange leap between one section of woods to another across a highway about a half mile from my home. It was black, hairy, and ape-like at a glimpse. About three years ago, me and my wife heard a tapping on the window behind us around midnight. We laughed about it at first, but my cousin from across the street called me moments after and said there's something big in your yard. I could hear it running through your yard. It's in the woods now. We investigated and heard it rustling through trees, but never saw it. The next morning, outside the window that was tapped on was a large humanoid footprint. Barefoot, taut tap on the glass would require something to stand upright, at least five feet minimum, given the lifted foundation. About three years ago, a buddy and I were hanging out, and we saw something strange walk into my cousin's yard across the street. It was large, black, and furry. It walked on all fours and appeared like a pig at first glance. We scoped in on it and couldn't determine what it was. It had a dog-like snout, but the stature and build of a hawk. It was about the size of a large hog, or perhaps a large bear cub. I don't remember it having a tail. It sniffed around his house, circled it, and went back into the woods. About a year ago, I was driving at night from the far end of my road. There is a curve approximately a half mile from where my friend reported seeing the creature. In the curve, as I banked a bit, my headlights shined into the woods and revealed I shine about six feet off the ground. I stopped the car next to where the eye shine was to examine it. I didn't see anything else, but the smell of rotting meat flooded the car, and I promptly left. About a year ago, I was outside around midnight when I heard a strange noise in my cousin's yard. I shined a flashlight over there and caught some eye shine at average height from the ground. It looked at me 
and kept walking into the wood line. In my experience, if you spotlight something and can see its eyes shine, they stop and stare at you. This thing kept going but watched me the whole time. I continued to shine into the wood line for a bit longer and it returned about 15 feet down the wood line. And it stared at me from within the woods and turned around. I continued to shine my light and caught it one more time in the same place as the second encounter. It looked at me for a moment and turned away. I didn't see the eye shine again. At the time, I had an eerie feeling that it seemed too sentient to be a deer or a hog. Maybe a big cat, but normal woodland critter from around here. I live in a fenced at night gatehood. Road to the north, little stream followed by two large, large for the suburbs, properties, then a small horse stable, then the rest of the suburbs to the east forest and a large horse stable to the south and a dollar general then main road to the west overall i live in a somewhat densely populated area three kppbl but where my neighborhoods it's mostly suburbs and a few random pockets here and there that you'd think are in the boonies if you saw a picture of it without ever living here anyways when i was little currently 15. For whatever reason, I always went to the bathroom with the door open. I don't need more, thank God. That habit changed. One day when I was seven, I saw a shadow with no body pacing back and forth in the hallway that lead to both my room and the bathroom, not getting too close to the bathroom and never getting too far from my line of sight. I imagine a backwards E is the layout of this hallway. Top horizontal bear is the stairs leading downstairs. Middle is my room. Bottom is the bathroom. You can't see past the stairs from the bathroom. I could tell where my room was because it was daytime and my room has a long window near the roof and the door is open, making that part of the hallway blue. It was of a tall, skinny woman with short, straight hair. We had no visitors but all my family. Brother, father, and... Mother was home. They were all downstairs, and like I said, you can't see further than the stairs from the bathroom. My mom is short, a bit overweight, and has long curly hair. I got scared shitless, so I quickly finished and ran downstairs to tell them what happened. As I was finishing, I saw her stop in front of my room, turn towards it, then sort of disappear by fading away as she walked in. Um. A few years later, I was talking to a neighborhood friend of mine who's the same age as me about ghosts. We were probably 11 or 12 at the time. I asked him if he had ever seen a ghost before and without me having ever told him about what I saw at that point, he told me that one night when he was 10, he woke up in the middle of the night and didn't know why. He looked towards his bedroom door and there stood a shadow darker than the surrounding room of a tall, skinny woman with short, straight hair seemingly staring right at him. His little sister is many years younger than us and slept with his mom. And his mom's sister are tall and skinny with long, wavy hair. He said it was 3D, so it had some depth to it. When I saw the ghost, I saw it was flat, like an actual shadow, until it walked into my room and faded away. After he told me his story, I told him mine. Not exactly the scariest thing ever, but it still gives me the creeps sometimes thinking about it. I grew up in western Colorado, not too far from the Utah border. There are old roads going everywhere in the desert out there. You can go for days and days without seeing another soul. Pretty remote. I was around 17 when a good friend and I acquired some magic mushrooms. We, being super in touch with nature and stuff, decided to go into the desert for a couple of days and find our spirit animals or whatever silly shit you do on mushrooms. My friend ended up having to postpone for a day. Don't remember why, but I was bummed. I made the decision to just go out alone the first night and get good and drunk for a day. Good decisions abound. After followed an old road for several hours that took me into Utah, I ended up at the bottom of a canyon next to the Colorado River. There was a beautiful sandbar out in the river a bit that I decided to make my camp on. 
I didn't want to get my old Toyota pickup stuck trying to drive to it and figure my friend coming later would see my truck and have an easy time finding me if he didn't have a reception to call me. So I just made a few trips wading through about knee-deep water to bring my camping stuff, which consisted of fishing pole, guitar for sweet jams, handle of super top shelf, plastic bottle of whiskey, vanilla coke to make whiskey taste slightly less of death portable CD player, also for sweet jams, sleep mat, water for the hangover, snacks, tarp, and my handy dandy SKS super cheap semi-auto rifle that shoots the same bullet as an AK, because mountain lions. So I settled in a bit and discovered that the side of the sandbar facing the river was covered in driftwood. Being an excellent friend, I decided to make a cool campsite with the driftwood for when my buddy arrived. Drinking shit whiskey, let's call it shitski from now on, and building a driftwood camp in the desert sun on a river was a great way to spend a day. Ten of ten? There was a fire pit with benches, a little shelter with a smaller pit to keep drinks and snacks from cooking in the sun. All good and functional campsite stuff. Then Shitsky started to wrap its fingers around my brain. The stuff I made became less functional. Totem poles, longer pieces just sunk into the sand like a mini driftwood forest, etc. As night set in, I built a nice fire and decided to crank up the aforementioned sweet jams and go catfishing. I had early success with my endeavor and decided to eat the freshly caught catfish. After my delicious, well-deserved meal, I decided to honor the magnificent beast by placing its head on the top of one of my driftwood totems. Shortly thereafter, the shit ski finished me off, and I apparently decided slightly wet sand was a good place to rest my bones. I was awakened at far too early an hour, covered in insect bites with a terrible, terrible headache. What had awoken me from my drunken slumber and was compounding the effects of the headache was a colony of loud-ass birds nesting on the cliff opposite the river from me. I don't know what kind they were, but the sound was more than I could bear in my state. Idiot logic kicked in, and I decided to silence them by firing Mr. SKS in their general direction, which didn't work. Don't worry. I made sure not to hit their nests or anywhere near them. I am not a murderer, unless you are a delicious catfish. At this exact moment, a tour group of rafters came around the bend just upriver from me. Having just heard rifle shots, they were all dead silent and staring at me in horror. There I was, in all my young, stupid glory, standing in my tidy whities covered in bug bites, my long, hippie hair looking exactly like I had spent the night sleeping in wet sand, holding a Chinese assault rifle, surrounded by totem poles and all sorts of weird shit. This banquet of what the EF being garnished by a catfish head on a stick. I fully realized this region receives a lot of revenue from tourism, and I didn't want to be that asshole that ruins it for everyone, so I put on my best smile, made sure my junk wasn't showing, and slowly waved. As they very slowly floated past, not one of them moved. They just stared. Frozen in either horror or awe, maybe both. It was about eight years old when I went camping with my mom and her boyfriend at the time out in central Florida, between Tampa and Daytona, just a bit more south. We set up a fire and had hot dogs over the fire at about 11 a.m. My mom, after having a few glasses of wine, decided she was cold and being eaten alive by mosquitoes and decided to go to her tent and sleep. I asked for my own tent, so I set up mine for my mom's about 20 yards away. Fast forward about four hours later, I'm woken up by thick or heavy foot steps by my tent. I figured it was my mom or her boyfriend going to the bathroom, so I didn't think anything of it until I heard more. More and more, I heard footsteps near my tent and I laid motionless. I was absolutely petrified. It was about four sets of feet pounding the dirt inches from my tent. The fire was out, and it was a pitch-black night. And then I saw two lights. One was red, and the other was a flash of white. Not like a picture. More like a blink or a strobe that was cut off. The red light stared directly at me like it knew exactly where I was. 
After what felt like four hours, the sound of the steps faded off, and I hauled ass to my mom's tent to wake her and my boyfriend. The most startling part was the morning after. My mom woke me up in a flurry, and we left the campsite early in the morning. Everything was almost packed and was shoved into our Bronco. She never told me why. Two of my friends snuck out last summer and took a walk listening to music. They decided to sit down on the road and talked a bit, and they both heard a distant scream that sounded pretty similar to an elk screech, but for like one second in duration. So they turned off the music and saw a huge humanoid horse looking thing sprint out of this forest into a field, and they said it was running really fast, like 40 miles per hour. They said it was kind of hunched and had a limp, was lean but muscular, and was completely pale gray and naked. They both sprinted home and Facebooked each other when they got home and told me and a few others about it the next day. I was in disbelief, so I snuck out on my bike the next night with my other friend and met up with the two original people along with some others and went looking for it. We heard the noises they described, and I and my one friend saw a pale Bigfoot-looking creature walk in front of someone's barn light like 300 yards away, but we're not sure. We continued to do this for a few nights, and one of them was walking to meet up with us alone to go looking for it, and had seen it like five times on the walk there, sometimes like 20 feet in front of him. We probably all went looking for it six or seven times in total. The last time we went looking, we all saw it, and it was super tall, like eight, ten feet, super fast, and had these glowing eyes you could see from a mile away. I'm pretty sure I also saw it have these long, greasy locks, strands of hair about shoulder length. It looked like a mix between a crawler, Aaron Yeager Titan form, and Jeff the Killer. It was creepy. Then it was on the pavement. You could hear clapping noises like it had hooves or something. Aside from this, I was on a late-night gas station walk later that summer with two of my friends at three in the morning. On our way back, we saw something run hobble across the road about 70 yards in front of us, and it looked pretty similar. However, it was much smaller, maybe five feet tall, but I could see it being maybe seven feet if it was standing fully upright. This was in rural northeast Ohio. I forgot to add that we were walking on the way back to my friend's house one of the nights and behind somebody's house. We heard the noise of a baby crying in the woods. I couldn't have been mistaken for anything else but a baby. As soon as you bat an eye at that thing, you went zoom. You had to be looking in the right place at the right time. Half the people would see it and be like, Oh, there he is. The other half would look over and he'd be gone. I don't think he was a crawler, since those are slow. This dude was super quick. My first thought when I heard my friend explain it was Wendigo. It could have been, not sure. I've seen its full body a few times, and the first time it was sprinting like 60 miles per hour in a field propelling itself with its front legs, and its back legs were really short and limp, like the Rex arms. I don't believe it was hairy, but I do recall seeing some long, greasy locks about shoulder length. There's a movie I remember seeing on Netflix called Sorry to Bother You, and in the movie there are these tall, green-looking humanoids with horse heads who used to be people but took a drug and it turned them into horse people. Look it up. It looked similar, mixed with a crawler and about 10 or 15 feet tall standing. I remember seeing it next to a ranch house, and it was easily taller than the house. I would describe the way it runs as somewhat like a chicken. So the story didn't happen to me, but to my fiancé and her mother. We both live in a rather large town in England. This town isn't really a nice place, to be honest. It's rough in most areas, but it's home. This is relevant. So anyway, both my fiancé and her mother were at the hospital one day for a reason I can't remember. But it wasn't anything serious. They had to take the elevator to get to their floor did their thing, and then got back on the elevator. When they got off, they said they were in a part of the hospital they'd never seen before. Even the elevator doors were different. They were like old and iron frame ones that you had to pull across yourself. They both went to get out when a nurse walked past them. She was dressed head to toe in an old 50s, 60s nurse uniform, and looked at them very angrily, telling them they weren't supposed to be there. 
My fiancé then looked out the window near the elevator and noticed trees that weren't on that side of the building and that the weather had changed suddenly from being rainy and gray to sunny. This never usually happens in England in the middle of February time. They both immediately got back in the elevator and took it up to the floor they were just on and then took the other one back down. To this day, not many people believe them. Some tried to say that maybe they were filming a TV show or film, but like I said, our town is quite rough, and the only show we had was one showing how rough it was. Plus, my fiancé never found any information in the local papers about some filming happening. Normally, if some filming happened, it was breaking news for our town. The hospital still freaks me out to this day, and I refuse to walk about it alone. I was a witness to El Chupacabra's attacks near Canavanas, Puerto Rico, on two occasions. In the second attack, I caught sight of El Chupacabra's killing a large dog in a field behind my father's workplace. It was after midnight, and I was there helping him get extra work done. We heard the dog growling in the backfield. I went to look and saw a four-foot-tall thing, very ugly, that I'd never witnessed before. The dog was keeping its distance from this thing when suddenly it leaped and attacked the dog. It took only a few seconds as it ripped the dog apart. It never made a sound. I quickly ran into the shop and told my father what I saw. He had a pistol and walked out to see what was there. The only thing that remained was the badly mutilated dog. I was sure it was El Chupacabras. There was talk of this creature for several days. It looked like a weird man in the distance shadow, but had a lizard head and hairless dog body up close. The large, dark eyes were very strange, and it used its teeth and long claws to rip apart the dog. I have read recently that many researchers consider this to be a legend, but I will state that it is a completely true creature. Those sightings outside of Puerto Rico and South America, I feel, are bogus and maybe just dogs. When I was around 12, 14 years old, I used to ride my quad literally everywhere. My town was literally on top of a cliff overlooking the river next to a decent amount of woods. These woods were filled with Native American artifacts. It wasn't well known in fear that an archaeological group museum would come in and clear the land for anything that was left. There was also a burial ground the locals were trying to preserve. Plus... I think it may be illegal. Anyway, there were still people who would dig next to the quad trails trying to find these artifacts. To dig for these artifacts, you need to go about less than a foot into the clay, and usually that's where they'd be. To do this, you only need small gardening tools. Hand trowel, hand shovel, etc. You wouldn't use anything bigger because you'll dig to deep. While I was riding... Quad one day with my friend on the back, I came around a tight corner with no view what was around the turn because it was so grown in, going way too fast because I was just a reckless kid. I came to a dead stop when a man was in the most misplaced spot right in the way of the trail. This isn't the biggest town. I've been growing up there my whole life. There wasn't many people I didn't know, especially in the woods, because it was my frequent hangout and I've never seen this guy before. This trail was up above the trail where people normally dig, on the very top of the cliff overlooking the river where anyone would know not to dig for artifacts because it's too rocky. This guy was just as startled as I was. He nervously locked eyes with mine and we just stared at each other for a couple seconds. He doesn't say a word, I don't say a word because he was creepy as hell looking and then he nervously burts out. I'm digging for arrowheads. I think I'd just gave him a head nod, and because he was blocking the way, I put the quad in reverse and started backing down the trail slowly, keeping eye contact the entire time. I took notice to the fact he had a regular wooden-handled steel-digging shovel with two large black garbage bags behind him that were definitely filled with something. He already dug a pretty big hole, I'd say, at least three foot deep and five foot wide. The tone in his voice was like he knew I didn't believe for a second he was digging for arrowheads. Nobody that knew they were there was that uninformed on the tools needed to find them. 
Me and my friend both thought what was in those bags, but as kids we kind of brushed it off and went about our day. It wasn't until a year or two later I really thought about it and uh, went back to the spot. I guess to dig them up and find out, I don't quite remember what my intentions were. That location was so grown in I couldn't pinpoint exactly where he was standing, so I never did find it again. I tried a couple more times later, but nothing ever came out of it. Until this day, I always wonder why that guy was so shady if he was burying a human body or body parts. If so, he was smart because people didn't venture up there and he knew it would only become more grown in. As a child, saw a ghost of what looked like either an elderly miner or farmer. Except wearing a striped cap like railway workers wore in the 30s. In a section of our home's basement, which was being extended, the opened-up area was about ten feet wide and equally deep. It was still mostly filled with dirt, except for where the foundation had been knocked out to add the expanded room. He just sat in a crouch, looking at me. I was about ten, and of course my family wrote it off as me being afraid of the dark, which I was. Years later, my mom saw him, too, in the finished room. No idea who he was or why he was there. He never spoke. Still curious almost fifty years later about why he was there. When I was at university, I had my crush over to watch a movie. It ended around midnight. As we were walking out of my living room, I turned off the lights and gave her a hug. She buried her face in my neck. One of those cute sort of hugs. When she looked up, she froze with her face just visible out of the corner of my eye. She had the most terrified expression, and her arms just locked me in place. Never been that squeezed, crushed before. I'm kind of chill at first, like, okay, this is weird, but not that weird. Then she just starts trembling and crying without moving her face at all, and I'm just stuck there, convinced she is seeing someone, something over my shoulder. I start pushing her away and saying... This isn't funny, what the F. She doesn't let go, and this goes on for two minutes straight. Meanwhile, I'm just repeating. What the F? What the F? Over and over. Convinced I'm about to get stabbed or possessed by whatever the F she is staring at. She gave a shudder at the end and just glanced at me with a look that said, What's gotten into you? I say, what the F just happened? And she just stares at me blankly like she has no idea what I'm talking about. I told her she needed to leave, and then I drove to spend the night at a friend's dorm room on the floor. Never been so freaked out in my life. For anyone wondering, I did see her again and more shit happened, but never to that level of creep show. I'm a softy at heart, and I figured the girl just needed help or had some level of emotional instability. I never thought I'd end up like this. A monster, a creature of legend that the Native American elders warned us about. It all started when my college decided to organize a cultural exchange program with a local reservation. It was supposed to be a chance for us to learn about their history, traditions, and way of life. We were warned not to wander too far from the group, but I didn't listen. It was a beautiful day, and the sun was shining brightly as we arrived at the reservation. We were greeted warmly by the locals, and they showed us around, telling us stories of their ancestors and the myths and legends that had been passed down through the generations. I was fascinated by it all and wanted to learn more. That's when I saw it. In the distance, a group of elders was performing a ritual. I couldn't resist the temptation to go and take a closer look. As I approached, I could feel the energy in the air. It was powerful, almost overwhelming. I watched in awe as the elders danced and chanted, their voices echoing through the valley. But then something happened. As the ritual came to an end, one of the elders noticed me. He approached me, his eyes blazing with anger. He spoke in his native language, and I didn't understand a word of it. But I knew he was angry. He pointed at me and muttered a curse under his breath. At first, I didn't think anything of it. I thought it was just a warning, a way for the elders to scare me away from their sacred ground. But then, things started to change. My skin began to itch and crawl. 
and my body felt like it was on fire. I could feel my bones shifting, my muscles contorting in ways they never had before. I tried to go back to my group, but I was too late. The transformation had already begun. I was becoming a creature of legend, one of the monsters that the elders had warned us about. I could feel myself losing control, my mind slipping away as the animal instincts took over. The other students were horrified when they saw me. They tried to run, to hide from the creature that I had become, but I couldn't let them go. I was consumed by a hunger, a desire to feed on their flesh and blood. I chased them through the reservation, my senses heightened by the transformation. I could hear their heartbeat, smell their fear. I was like a predator, stalking my prey. But then something strange happened. One of the locals, a wise old man, approached me. He spoke in his native language, and I could understand him. He told me that I was cursed, that the only way to break the curse was to perform a ritual, to ask for forgiveness from the spirits that I had offended. The other students helped me to perform the ritual, and as we did, I could feel the curse lifting. The transformation was reversing, and I was becoming human again. It was a close call, but we made it through. The experience had changed us all in ways that we could never have imagined. We had learned to respect the traditions of others, to listen to the warnings of our elders, and to never take the power of ancient rituals lightly. We had been given a second chance, and we vowed never to forget the lesson that we had learned on that fateful day. I was walking down the road one afternoon, about two in the afternoon, on February 3, 2000. I was in the hills around the Trask Mountain area near Carlton, Oregon. I heard a loud pitch squeal that was coming from down near the creek. As I started to walk to where I heard the noise, I noticed that there was big footprints in the muddy ground. So I started to creep real slow up to where I heard the noise, because I thought that. It might be Bigfoot, but I did not know. As I got closer to the creek, I heard a loud crack of some limbs of a tree, and that is when I saw him. Bigfoot. All that I saw was a ten-foot black ball of hair running up the bank into some thick forest area, and then it was gone. I look around where it was in the water, and there was a lot of prints and broken twigs. Now, what he was doing in the water, I do not know. I was scared at that time, so I ran out of there and got into my explorer and left. The next week, I went up to the same location, and the prints were gone. They had been washed away by the rain what I saw that day. I know I'll never see again, but I hope that one day I can meet it, face to face. While camping above Green Peter, well off the main road, my friends and I had an interesting experience. We were driving along the old logging road that branches left after the first bridge above the lake and stopped to smoke a cigarette. My friend wouldn't let me smoke in the Jeep. We got out and stretched our legs a bit and were talking about heading back to camp before it got too dark when, on the hillside below us, the strangest sound I ever heard rang out. It was like a long warble, almost like a sad wail, if it had been human. One of the guys there is an amateur bird watcher and assured us that it was most certainly not a bird. I suggested it might be an hurt animal. The sound was deep and resonated, but it sounded like something in pain. We had all heard of Bigfoot sightings in the area, so we couldn't resist an opportunity to look for whatever made the sound. At this point, the three other guys decided they should keep an eye on the car, so I grabbed my rifle. There were bear up there, too, and went down the hill. At first, I didn't notice anything out of the ordinary, but when I rounded a big fir tree, I found big crevice in the rocky hillside. It wasn't deep enough to hide anything, but the smell was awful. It was like a mixture of human feces and wet dog. Awful. I started to yell up the hill to my friends about the smell, but only got the first syllable out before something large and fast burst from the other side of the rock and down the hillside. All I saw was a flash of dark brown that could easily have been deer, but I found no deer sign or any other recent animal sign around. Scared the crap out of me. I have. Spent years in the woods in Oregon and have never before or since smelled anything like that or heard a similar sound.
This just happened to me three weekends ago on a float trip down in Arkansas. About seven, eight of us were sitting around a campfire. In a clearing behind our cabin about 11 p.m. and were just talking and listening to music. We'd been drinking, but I was absolutely not drunk. I was sitting at the six o'clock position facing north. I was looking up in the sky, watching for shooting stars. The sky was clear, and I counted about three shooting stars in about two minutes or so. Pretty common, I'd say. Streaks that came and disappeared pretty fast. I then looked to the west and saw what appeared to be a star moving in a snake-like trajectory. I first noticed it at about the nine o'clock position, and it snaked its way to about the one o'clock position in about four or five seconds. So it went from the sky in the west to a northeast position before going behind the tree line in a matter of seconds. I said to my buddy, who was sitting across from me, Hey, what's that? and pointed it out. He saw it and watched it about the 11 o'clock position and just said, Hum, I don't know. It was the size and brightness as any average star in the sky. I know it wasn't a plane because of the distance it covered and that it didn't blink. I know it wasn't a shooting star or a satellite because of the snake-like trajectory it took. I know it wasn't a firefly or insect because it didn't blink and the speed and distance it traveled. It looked just like as if a star-sized white light snaked its way across half the sky in an incredibly short amount of time. It seemed to be actually out in space, not something close like a bug. It didn't freak me out. More just baffled me. I've never seen anything like that, and for the life of me I can't determine what it was. That's the only thing I've ever seen that was truly unexplainable to me. I don't think it was a UFO, really, but I can't explain it. Thanks for listening, fellow cowboys. If you like what your old Montana does, do hit that like button and subscribe. I upload brand new episodes every day. Thank you, and see you tomorrow at the same time. God bless.